What's going on? What's going on? Welcome back to Won't You Be My Neighbor, the number one real estate podcast in Las Vegas. This is your boy, Brandon from Vegas. As always, I'm here with my partner, Mr. Bill Gaylord. Are we? Oh, we got it across God, the table. And today we have a special episode for you guys. The five ways Monopoly can teach you everything you need to know about real estate. Yes. I can't wait. I uh, have no idea where you're going with this. A lot of people don't realize that Monopoly was created to not only teach people how real estate works, but also to explain to them why monopolies were bad and how rich people use Monopoly to take over the world. Take over the world. Fun fact for you, Bill. Yes. More Monopoly money is printed per year than money that is printed in real money across the world. Fun fact. Really? More monopoly more money. More than what the U.S. Yes. prints every year? Every country. Trillions and every trillions? Monopoly is the world's most popular board game, and more wow. monopoly money is printed per year than real money in the world. That's amazing. That's a fact. Yes, sir. All right, let's get started. Bill, the five things. You want to start at number five and work our way to one, or you want to stop at number one and work our way to five? What do you think? I go five to one. Five to one. Okay. The number one way to win at Monopoly, Bill, can you guess what it is? The number one way to win at Monopoly. What's the number one way? What do you guess? Buy real estate. You cheated, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> After you buy real estate. <laughs> that was so easy, well, right? It's actually not the answer. It is. It? Okay. No, because everybody can buy real estate, right? Everybody can buy real estate. I can buy the reds, the yellows, greens, whatever. Right. The number one way to win a monopoly is to never let anybody else get a monopoly. Okay. The number two way to win a monopoly is never let anybody else get houses. So here's a fun fact for people. Hotels are actually the worst thing to build in monopoly because it puts four houses back on the market. Monopoly purposely puts a finite amount of green houses in the box. So once you've built all the houses, no one else is allowed to build houses. Okay. The reason this is interesting is because most properties, you need three houses. So there's only two houses left in the box and you have three properties, that's it. You cannot get any more houses until other people go bankrupt, right? Yep. The number one way to, min to win a monopoly is to limit other people's income. And as we're seeing right now in the real estate market, rich people are using that same leverage. They're building homes that are rent to own, which means entire communities are not buy and sellable by the middle class. We also see wealthy people buying up massive tracts of land, making it impossible for other people to build on it. We also see Wall Street and huge investment groups doing what? Buying tons homes. of investment properties that they'll never let hit the market again, right? Because they realized, like Monopoly taught you, the number one way to win the game is to own houses and not let anybody else join the party. Yeah. What do you think? I think you're right. I think there hasn't been any building in the last 10, 12 years, honestly, because the market just completely nosedived and they couldn't really build for less than the cost of uh, selling it. So um, there's just not all, enough homes out there. Just not. Did you know that there's 20 people, and when we include the Catholic Church, McDonald's, there's about 20 groups or people that own more land in America than everybody else combined? I did not know that. Yes, sir. And that is the number one way to win. If I own land and I own the houses, there's a finite amount of space. Once I own enough of it, there's just nowhere else to go. This is why we're seeing such a rise in the cost of properties, yeah. especially in coastal cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami, New York. It's even trickling to Vegas, right? We've simply run out of land that people want to live on. Well, and it's interesting. Uh, I was talking to one of our builder friends, who's the division <clears throat> vice president, who runs the sales division and all that. And I go, how's business? And he goes, it's good. Yeah. But I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to build any more homes. And I go, why is that? Well, they're, they're releasing land and we're bidding on it, yeah. but we're not winning the bid. So we have to have land in order to build. Yep. And I go, well, who's, who's winning the bids? It's... People who are banking the land, yep. they're just basically buying the land, which mm -hmm. is what you're talking about, knowing that that's going to go up in value. Yep. They'll eventually sell it to the builders, but they're going to elevate the price. At a huge markup. At a huge markup. One of the big things- Because they're I... just banking and they don't they don't necessarily need the money yeah. right now. They're just banking the, the land. Well, think of, there's a guy named uh, Michael Anthony Rua. A lot of you guys don't know his name, but realtors do because- his signs are all over the city. From North Las Vegas to Boulder City, you see his signs. Big white signs that say, 
You want to buy this land? You better come buy it from me. He's been he's been buying land and holding it in Vegas for how long? Because he knew, hey, eventually that California traffic, it'll make its way here. Yeah. You know? Well, and and I I've only been here six years, so I don't know all the you know all the players in this town, but I do know Howard Hughes. Howard oh. Hughes, when they came in here, he bought up a ton of land. Yeah. And he's still selling it. Most people don't realize and, and that. Howard Hughes has been gone for, for years. Ever. Most people don't realize Howard Hughes essentially owns Summerlin. Summerlin is basically Howard Hughes land. Yeah. Right? That's why they have the corporation up there. That's why they're building the Hollywood studio up there. He wisely, back in what the 60s or 70s, purchased him and his wife purchased all that land out yeah. in Summerlin. They own, they own majority of that. You have to buy land from them. It's one of the smartest purchases, right? Yes. For all sure. right. So, number one way to win a monopoly is to never let anybody else get a monopoly or houses. Little pro tip for you guys. If you play Monopoly with me, once I get a Monopoly, I'm taking every property and I'm putting it into mortgage. You're never getting that property from me. Yeah. Never. Never. I'm never going to let you have it. Why? I've got a Monopoly. Now you can't get one. You're screwed. Right? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's how the game is won. Number four. You ever play Monopoly, Bill, and get and pull a chance card? It, it's been so long since I've played really? Monopoly. You know, we should... I, I mean, I, if you put it here, I would say, oh, there's that, you know, the little characters that you kind of do 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 around yeah, yeah. little but, hat little yeah, boot, the hat, little boot. The yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so but it's been a long you time. strike me as a doggy guy you strike no, me as a, as a dog not the dog no no the ship um i think i i kind of like that thimble thing oh the little thimble i like yeah. i like when the thimble loses because you take your finger and you just <laughs> poop, flick it off the camera right one of the most annoying parts of monopoly a uh, part that people hate are the chance cards uh -huh. right send you to the nearest railroad send you to uh, boardwalk. But the chance cards are actually one of the most important aspects of Monopoly because it reflects real life, right? Sometimes you're doing poorly, you're broke, you're struggling, and then whoops, your car light hits on, or whoops, your landlord decides to sell the house, or whoop, uh, your kid gets sick or whatever, right? right. Life throws these curveballs at you. 100%. Sometimes you're doing well and life is like, hey, here's an extra $200. And you're like, wow, what a great, you know, what a great moment. I think the chance cards accurately reflect how life works because sometimes you get money you weren't expecting and sometimes you're absolutely <laughs> Okay? Uh, the other day That's I was- a good way of putting it. And it's true. It's true. Uh, I was playing Monopoly the other day with my, my niece Kylie and she's got the greatest luck ever. Every chance card she pulled was like, here, you get $100. Here. Here's $150. Here's $50. Go to go. Click. She couldn't stop pulling the good cards. And every time I was pulling it, it was just like, you owe everybody 50 bucks, chairman of the board. I said, man, Monopoly has really captured how it feels to be black in America. Uh, they know. They, they just knew who I was. They could sense it. And it was like a perfect recollection of like how certain people end up in certain places, right? Because yeah. sometimes even if you're broke, even if you're struggling and you think life is supposed to throw you something positive, it throws you a pay $50 to every player on the board and you don't have nothing but $50 left, yeah. you know? And so it's accurate. You, If the game didn't have the chaos, it wouldn't accurately reflect how life works. And it is it is chaos. Life is chaos for many, many people, all of us. Ups, downs, twists, turns. 100%. And it just, it doesn't matter. Honestly, in my opinion, Brandon, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or not. 100%. It's just how you accept what, what has come into your world and then try and adjust and adapt. And just adapt, 100%. And I think adapt's the greatest way to put it, right? The greatest success stories are people who know how to adapt to the chaos. You can't control it. Trying to control chaos is what drives people insane. You can't control it. I yeah. tell people all the time, I can't predict the cost of houses next year, but I can tell you it's probably going to go up, right? Yeah. I can't control the interest rates, but I can adapt to it. I can buy now and refinance later. I can use some of the tricks and education that's out there, right? right? All right. Uh, can I, I'm going to give you one example for, yeah. for me, right? So interest rates went from 3%, two and three quarters, and they jumped up to over 7%. Yeah. At one point, they were over 8%. So our industry was in just chaos because it just stopped. There was no refinances. Mm -hmm. There was people stopped buying for a while. And then all of a sudden, you have so much less business out there and there's so many people that are in the industry. Mm -hmm. We went from 180,000 mortgage originators down to their estimating about 75,000. Yeah. And it was just like, okay, I have to adapt to this. Yes. How am I going to adapt? I'm going to meet with people like Brandon, who's out there making it happen. 
And that's really what I've done over the last you know few years. And you know, for me, I've had to adapt. Hundred uh, percent. Same on the real estate side, right? Uh, the real now there are some big time realtors who have so many leads, so many um, networking opportunities that no matter what the rate is, right, they're pretty mm-hmm. consistent. But I think we've lost tens, if not hundreds of thousands. Of, in Vegas, I know we've lost you know thousands across the country. It could yeah. be you know hundreds of thousands. And one thing that I realized long ago, back in 2020 during COVID, is you can no longer just rely on marketing to your sphere of influence, right? Uh, I do a live class, such as this podcast, where we market to home buyers in Florida, Tennessee. I don't know who wants to move to Vegas, but I know I want to find them. Right. Right? Right. And so you have to adapt. And a lot of people who don't adapt just die. Right. Right? Which takes us to number three. Okay. You're going to laugh at this, Bill. Okay. This is the clippable, all right? (laughs) The number one thing people say on social media is that houses are overpriced. But when I ask them what is the worst, most overpriced piece of real estate in Monopoly, nobody gets it right. Not one person gets it right. So they swear they know a house is overpriced, but when you show them overpriced in a child's board game, they don't have a clue. Bill, what's the most overpriced piece of property in Monopoly? Now, you haven't played in a while. So <laughs> I'm going to say Park Place or or what's the boardwalk? one right next to Boardwalk? Those are not, that's the second most overpriced. Okay. Second most overpriced. The number one most overpriced are the pieces right next to them, the greens. They are purposely overpriced by the makers of the game to teach you a lesson on value, right? To buy the greens outright, you start the game with $1,500. Right. $1,500. To buy the greens outright, it costs you nearly 80% of your total budget. You don't return value on those properties until you put two houses on each one. Right. Each house is $200, right? And you have to buy three of them, so $600. So you need another $1,200 on top of your initial $1,150 investment to start seeing a return on value. You start the game at $1,500. How are you supposed to profit on those things? Right. Right. right? More importantly, how often do you land on all three spaces in one go? In one go. You usually have to bargain, negotiate, right? What happens is you usually get two of them. You spend your whole budget, and then the third one stays elusive. Now you've blown half your budget on a properties that don't return value, and you're stuck. Right. And you're stuck. Yet when you I've, – I've done this. Uh, my live class, we do a Monopoly event once a month. Not one person has – ever guessed the greens as the most overpriced properties. I bet they will now. Now they will. (laughs) But but what it teaches you is that the average person has no clue what overpriced looks like. They either think the most expensive property, Park Place Boardwalk, are the overpriced ones, or they think the cheapest ones are overpriced and the worst ones. They have no clue what actual value looks like. Yeah. One of the things you and I try to teach people is what real estate value actually is. We try to teach them that the word overpriced doesn't really exist in real estate. If the house is too expensive, guess what? <laughs> no one buys, buys it, it and they have to drop the price. It's all market driven. It's all market driven. One of the funny things, um, a lot of people don't know this, is you don't actually have to pay the price what's listed on the monopoly piece. Right. People don't know this because a lot of people don't you play. Don't. You don't. You can put it up for auction. Right. So let's say you land on boardwalk and you don't want to pay $400. You throw it on the table and go auction it. Now, guess what happens? A real estate deal happens. Right. Where people have to bid on the house versus each other and see what actual value looks like. And then it turns into a market price. And then it turns into a market price. Guess what? Sometimes boardwalk, if you get boardwalk at the end of the game, I've gotten boardwalk for a hundred bucks. Because no one else can afford to buy it, right? (laughs) Because you got all the money. 100%. But at the beginning of the game, when everybody has money, Boardwalk can go for $600 because everybody wants Boardwalk. Boardwalk. Accurately reflects the real estate market, right? Yeah. When the interest rates are low and people have a bunch of money, everybody wants Boardwalk. When the interest rates are higher and people don't have as much money, nobody wants Boardwalk, right? right? Yeah. So there is no overpriced. It's all depending on how much money is at the table, right? Right. This leads us into number two. What are the best properties in Monopoly? Give us a guess, Bill. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna go back to uh, to um, I just like Park Place. You like Park Place? Yeah. Let me give you a hint. 
It's not Park Place. Let me give you a hint, okay? <laughs> the most landed on property in Monopoly is jail. Wow. Really? It's the most landed on property in Monopoly. There's multiple cards so, that send you to jail. There's multiple ways to go to jail because you can roll three doubles, whatever. Right. So jail, just by sheer coincidence, happens to be the most landed on property in Monopoly. Mm -hmm. So the most valuable property in Monopoly are the oranges because they're the properties that you most likely land on when you get out of jail. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Because they have a premium location. And what do we teach people about real estate? The most important things in real estate are location, 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 location. 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 After that, it becomes return on investment. Right. What can I get this property for versus what it makes me? Right. Bill, in your experience, when people go looking for houses, do they ever look at houses that they can afford? Not typically. I mean, there's some that have budgets that they really have. Sure. Um, but some are just like they... They don't really know exactly where they stand, and so they may overspend on something. Yes. So, most people, if their budget is four hundred thousand, they're on Zillow looking at four hundred and fifty thousand, yes. right? Because they don't focus on the two most important things. When you're buying a home, I know it's emotional. You want to focus on your kids and schools, and I get the emotional part, but you have to take all that away and focus on two things: a great location and a great return on investment. How cheap can I get the house versus how much equity will that house provide me, right? I would rather, and let's use Las Vegas as an example. I could show someone a $500,000 house on the east side of Vegas with a pool and a yard and, and so much space, but how much is that house going to be worth five years from now Right. versus a $500,000 house in Summerlin, which is going to be much smaller, no pool, maybe only three bedrooms, two baths. But in five years, that house could be a six hundred, you know, thousand dollar house. Yeah, that's where we're trying to put people: great locations with return on investment, sure. right? Definitely. Now, yeah. I'm not going to break down the numbers because it does. I'm a monopoly nerd, so it gets a little nerdy, right? But the orange pieces are cheap to buy; cost less than half of your budget to acquire them. To return on investment, you only need two houses, which they're a hundred dollars each. You need two houses, $600 total, which means for less than your starting budget, you can own properties both, that both. start yep. returning instant yep. value, yep. right? And most people don't see it that way. They focus on park place and boardwalk, right? Right. right. I know on the lending side, you see these mistakes as well. Well, I, I look at it too, Brandon, is you know, location, location, location. Yeah. It's a lot of it is a calculated risk. Yeah. And I think in order for people to make a calculated risk, they have to have information. Mm -hmm. They have to be educated. Yes. They have to understand what they're getting into. And what do we got? We got a question. Oh, we got a question. Bring it in. Uh, yeah, so Luis Ortega on YouTube asks, is it better to rent and save until you can buy or just try to afford the house and then refinance later? I'm gonna let Bill start this one off and then I'll, I'll, I'll tag team at the end of this. Yeah, and I think part of it does depend on what your situation is and whether or not you know, I call it the sleep factor. Can you sleep at night knowing that you can make your, your mortgage payment? Are there other ways for you to actually make that payment? Do you want to bring somebody into the mix in regards to house hacking to help you get that payment, you know, a little bit lower for you so that you can win long term? So there's some of it's just sacrifice. And then um, my opinion, though, right now is if you make an educated decision, you go in and you know exactly where you're getting, what you're getting into, knowing that you may pay a premium right now on the mortgage payment that you can refinance down the road and lower your payment. Mm -hmm. it, it just is, you know, it's really up to you and you just have to have that mindset and make a calculated risk. The biggest word that Bill used was sacrifice, okay? And I'm going to get in trouble for this, but oh, no. Austin, get ready to clip this. <laughs> Hold on, like live? Yeah. <laughs> Most people in America are renting above their means. I'm going to repeat this again. Most people in America are renting above their means. I see people in California who say, I can't leave California because I'm making too much money, but they don't pay you enough money to buy a house, do they? No. Then you're not making enough money. Most people are renting above their means because they'd rather be comfortable and feel rich than actually be rich. They're not willing to sacrifice their comfort 
to get what they want. They would rather pay $1,800 for a luxury apartment than try to find something cheaper and, and save money. Let me give you guys an example. I was dead ass broke in 2016, literally homeless, okay? I got a decent job where I could hustle tips and I'm great at hustling tips. I could have probably afforded a $1,500 apartment, but I was by myself and I was broke. So I found a $500 dirt bag studio on Carson and 7th with all the crackheads and prostitutes. And I grinded it out in a $500 studio with no bedroom, right? But that $500 a month allowed me to save my entire paycheck. I could put $2,500 down, get it for five months, and save every other penny, hey. and then eventually move to a nicer, comfortable place. So it's not that rent is bad, it's that so many people rent above their means. Yeah. If more than 35 to 40% of your income is going to rent, you're above your means. Now, if you have kids, I understand. Once you have kids, everything changes. If you're listening to this and you have kids, I get it. Everything changes once you have a kid. Your, their safety is more important than what you want. But if you're a single person or it's just you and your girlfriend, y'all need to cut that out. You don't need the luxury apartment with the resort pool. You don't need all that crap. Find the cheapest apartment that you can stand to live in, suck it up for a year, save money, and get yourself a property. That's my honest, sincere answer. I think it's a great, uh, a great answer, and, and I think they do. I think a lot of people are making that choice to live by their friends, by the yeah. people that are the, their friend group and that kind of thing. But, they, but I think a lot of them, Brandon, they don't have a game plan. Yeah. They don't know exactly what they need to do to get to the next level. They don't know what do they need for a down payment. What, do, what can they afford as a payment? Yep. What happens if their income goes up? Yep. What if they're making commission? Can we use that commission income to, to do it? What if they combine a family member as a co-signer? What do they have if they want to have a, uh, a person that also rents a room? So getting a game plan together so they know where they're going, to me, that's the biggest thing. Because a lot of people are like, you know, when I talk to people, they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea. I'm clueless on this. Yeah. So the people that reach out and then at least understand where they're at right now can get that game plan and then maybe move into a little bit different situation yep. to save the money that's necessary. Yep. I have been teaching, a, education is key. I've been teaching a live class on TikTok for four years. And so far, we've had 79 people over four years tell me, hey, just using the information that you taught me for free, we, we're in a house. We didn't realize how close we were to buying because no one tells us this information. This is why me and you started this podcast. This is why we put so much real estate information out there. This is why we have a playlist with over 50 videos. Most people could probably buy a house or a townhome today if they just knew what they needed, right? Well, that, but I also, I look at you as coach, like coach Brandon, right? And what does a coach do? A coach tells you what to do, yeah. right? And some people are like, they don't know what to do. And when somebody tells them what to do and they have that plan and then they have the goal of what, where they need to be, then they're like, oh, that's all I had to do? Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. 100%. So I think the way you are coaching and you're telling people what to do, I think people need that. And when I talk to the, the clients, they love it. They love that you're authentic and that you tell them, here's what you need to do and here's how it is. You want authentic? You want authentic? Oh, I don't know where <laughs> this is going. YouTube, you want authentic? If you're a single man in America, renting attracts bops. I'm going to repeat this again. Renting attracts bops because bops love nothing more than a dude who loves blowing his fucking money. Serious. When you're renting a luxury apartment and you're spending $2,500 on a luxury apartment or a penthouse or a condo and you got all this nice stuff in your rental apartment, a bop will see that and be like, oh, this dude loves blowing money on stupid stuff. I can't wait for him to blow it on me. Being real. When you own a home, I don't care if it's a condo or a townhome, you will start attracting a different quality of partner because you're showing people out there that you're someone who has a game plan, you have discipline, and you have knowledge. 
When you rent, you're attracting people who love blowing money just like you. This is a fact. It is known. Bill, are you ready for the I, number one thing Monopoly teaches you? As the you can tell, I don't, I don't know very much about Monopoly. That's no, okay. So I'm excited to hear no, this no, one. No, Bill, the best, the best part about this is you know about money. I do. Right? You know about money which is why we did it on the Monopoly side. My audience knows Monopoly. They know games. They don't know money. Right. You know money. I do know. So we're translating everything that they know from childhood board games into real life. The number one most important thing about Monopoly is most people just go around the board trying to collect $200 until it's far too late. You start the game off with $1,500. You're on top of the world. You're buying railroads, utilities. You're making it around the board. You get another $200. You're buying properties that only cost $100, $150. Even when you have to pay rent, $8, $12, $20. I'm about to make $200. I don't give a sh. Even if I land on boardwalk, that's 50 bucks. I'm about to make 200 on the next go around, right? Yeah. But then somebody starts to get multiple railroads and you have to pay $50 and $100. Then someone builds their first house and now you have to pay $70. Uh-oh, you landed on luxury tax. There's another $75. Uh-oh, you landed on income tax. Your $200, gone. Eventually, and this is what Monopoly to me is the single most important board game and every kid should be forced to play it, is because you very quickly realize how little your weekly paycheck means in Monopoly. And that, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, it's clearly evident today. Yes. With the inflation and what's going on there. Yes. Very quickly, your $200 doesn't make it or even mean anything anymore. Eventually, you can't land on any space for $200. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you'd want to stay in jail. I'm being honest. The best strategy, the longer the game goes, is to just sit in jail, not pay anybody anything. And unfortunately, we see that in real life too, where it's just cheaper for some people to be in jail. They feed you, there's a free gym, you got friends. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm making yeah. jokes, but honestly, there's a lot of people where jail is honestly just easier than real life. Because yeah. in real life, there's daily payments, there's bills, there's rent, and it's like, I'm tired of all this, mm -hmm. right? Get rich or die trying. I would rather do something that risk put me in jail than to continue going around the board and giving up my two hundred dollars. Yeah, you know, and so many people they feel so comfortable with their paycheck every two weeks they go around the board for that two hundred dollars until one day that two hundred dollars doesn't pay for anything anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's because people value money more than the asset. Money is nothing in Monopoly. The asset is everything. I can mortgage my properties to get more money. I can sell houses to get more money. Money is nothing. And that's what Monopoly is supposed to teach you, right? Yeah. How many times do we see people who have good jobs? They have good jobs, but they still can't afford anything because they have, what, too much debt, not enough assets, not enough savings. Their paycheck doesn't get them where they want to go. Right. And, that, and to get ahead, you have to, you really need to invest in something. In something. It doesn't, whether it's the house whether it's stocks, whether it's some kind of investment, mm -hmm. that's going to allow you to build the wealth. Yes. Otherwise, that money's going to come in and go out and come in and go out. And then it's going to come in and more is going to go out. And then eventually you're just not going to have enough money to pay for anything. 100%. And then you have the assets that will grow. I yeah. mean, and that's where you, you basically make the, uh, make the money. People think more money is the answer, right? How many, how often... Do you talk to people and they think more money is the answer? But everybody knows the more money you make, the more money you spend. If Monopoly, instead of starting off with $1,500, you started off with $3,000, double the money, most people would end up in the same exact position. I could give you $10,000. It wouldn't change a single thing. You would still end up in the same exact position. More money doesn't fix anything. All it does is inflate the cost of properties. That's it. That's it. But I I do believe that 
people don't invest because of fear. Mm -hmm. I think it's because they're going to give the money up mm -hmm. and they're really worried about making the wrong, you know, basically making the wrong decision and they think it's going to go away. But that comes from the education. That comes from listening to people like you, looking at the stock market, looking at various things yeah. and trying to get that education to where you understand when you go in what you're looking at. I agree with you on the fear part. But as someone who grew up broke, and this is the most relatable part about me, there's a fear of seeing money leave your account, right? When I open my bank account and I see a hundred grand in there, it 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 makes the kid who grew up poor feel safe. I look at the money, I, I check my bank once per day. I'm a sicko. I check my bank account once per day just to make sure the money's there, uh -huh. right? Because it comforts me, it makes me feel good. Knowing that they're about to take $37,000 out of my account for a down payment on a house scares the living crap out of me, right? Because having the money, being able to see it, makes it real, makes me feel safe and comfortable. But as you said, that's just fear talking. There's no, there's nothing to be gained from having the money just sitting there, No, right? You're just gonna keep going around the board until eventually we inflate your money into nothing. And it's gotta be invested in something. We talked about this last week and I'm gonna bring it up here again. There's the guy who spends one third of his paycheck on Uber Eats. Then there's the guy who takes one third of his paycheck and invests, invests it into Uber Eats, right? Right. Eventually, after one, two, three years, those people are gonna be so far apart financially that they'll be unrecognizable. They, they work the same job, they make the same amount of money. One of them invests in himself and the other one invests in food and it's gonna get them separated. So how do you get over the fear? What do you believe will, you know, what got you over the fear of having them take $37,000 out of your account to buy the house? Oh, I started- Obviously you're in real estate, you understand. <laughs> but what do you think for someone who is not in your situation right now, what, what can get them over that fear? Um, I was fortunate in that my job puts me around people who are successful. Not rich, successful. And I saw what they did. They had investments. They had stock. They put their money into other businesses. They had multiple streams of income. And they all told me the same thing. When one rich person tells you something, you're like, yeah, whatever. When 20 rich people tell you the same thing, yeah, we own rental properties. We own investment properties. I own stocks in Zillow. We put our money, we take whatever our paycheck is and put it right back into investments. After 20 of them tell you that, you're like, okay, well, how dumb am I to think I'm smarter than you? I'm broke, you're rich, why would I think I'm better than you, right? And that's the hurdle that I think anybody watching this needs to get over. Stop thinking you're smarter than people who are more successful than you. Maybe your IQ is higher, maybe you got better grades in high school, but none of that means anything. You're going around the Monopoly board throwing your money away. Listen to the people who are more successful of you. That's the only way to overcome the fear. I want to I want to circle back real quick on the yeah. on what we were talking about before. And you said something about hanging out. You you are there's an expression out there. You're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Oh. Okay? And I see it like when I go down to the casino strips and you have groups of people that are going to uh, bachelor parties or they're going to bachelorette parties or they're getting everybody in that group is the same. And yes. you can see that what they wear, what they do, you know, what they do, the heels that they have on, yep. everything is the same. So in terms of trying to improve, mm -hmm. sometimes it means, get, you know, hanging out with different people. Mm -hmm. You rarely see hot girls hanging out with ugly girls. You rarely see rich dudes hanging out with broke dudes. I'm just being real. You, you rarely see a group of like four buff fit dudes hanging out with a big fat dude like me. You never, I'm just being real. <laughs> there are groups out there that are like that, but they are a rare minority. You you are the weakest link of your group. You are, you are the weakest link of your group. And I always believe in the theory that you should be the, the, the dumbest, brokest person in your group, because that means you have nothing but people that you can learn from. Yeah. You know, or, or if you don't wanna learn the hard way, me and Bill are here to teach you for free. I may be a little mean, I may hurt your feelings a little bit, but that's why I have Bill here. <laughs> yeah, I have a hard time like saying some things that might be like 
upset people. Because I, I like people to like me. Yeah. You don't really care. I don't care. You don't care. I got, I got Which a, is great, but that's why people like you. Yeah, they may yeah. like you more than they like me, for sure. I like you more than I like me. That's a fair fact. That's why your face is literally behind my head for the entire... <laughs> well, I guess I should move over. Maybe should no, no, no. My over. head is big enough. Trust oh, me. You, there we go. you couldn't cover my head up. That thing is... Look at this thing, bro. I got a melon for a squeezer. Come on, man. <laughs> Bill, I appreciate you coming on and doing this with me. Uh, I didn't tell you what we were going to be talking about today because I wanted... I wanted to get an honest reaction out of you. I, I did. I wanted... You are a perfect semblance of the audience. They don't know why properties are good. They don't know why the oranges are good, right? Yeah. You don't know because you don't play the game. They don't know because they don't know real estate, right? So you were a weird mirror reflection of our audience, and that's really one that I wanted to focus on today. So thank you for, for playing along to my little game. Next week, we can do the opposite. You can show up here with like, a, a segmented topic and I'll just be the I'll be the buffoon and you can and, and we can flip it. We can do like a lending topic, right? You can yeah. just throw it in my face. So um Bill, I know your numbers on the screen and it's right behind me, but still tell people all the ways that can reach you and explain to them that it doesn't cost them a dime. I need people to hear this. Yeah. If you have any if you need any help whatsoever, I had someone email me today mm -hmm. basically saying, should I go in? I'm only making this. My FICO score is 800. I have saved money. And I'm like, let's figure out where you need to go. BillGaylord.com, free mortgage consultation, super easy. You just click the button, schedule a time that works for you, and then we run your numbers. And uh, I do it for free. I love it. I absolutely love sharing this wisdom from this bald head right now and uh, making sure that people know where they're at and where they want to go. Perfect. Bill, I'm Brandon from Vegas. Uh, you can find me on the YouTube that you're watching. <laughs> We're on Spotify, Apple, or just go to Google and type in Brandon from Vegas and he all my all my dumb everywhere. stuff will pop up everywhere. <laughs> you know, it just I'm very easy to find easy nowadays, to find. right? Yeah. We're we're ubiquitous with the internet. But our mission here is to help people and as funny as it was using Monopoly, I think a lot of the things we said can help people. Guys, in the comment section of this video, I'm gonna repost the five things in the description box. That way, if you guys want to recycle and kind of see a synopsis of the five ways Monopoly can teach you real estate, it's available for you guys right there. Uh, we look forward to your guys' questions and comments. Any questions you guys have, please leave them in the comments section of the video. Me and Bill will follow up. We're glad to work with you guys directly. And then there's a real estate contact form also in the description box if you guys want to contact us directly via email, phone call, or text, anything like that. And I'm going to play Monopoly now with my four-year-old. I think we should do a live Monopoly. Honestly, I think we should do a live <laughs> Monopoly. Yeah. I think that'd be interesting yeah. to do a live Monopoly game here yeah. in the studio and just show people, like, why I'm you know going to crush you. Grace gets here. Yeah, Grace gets here. Oh, that'd be, that'd well, be that's a, right. Grace is here next week. So that'd be a fun. We'll live stream. A, we'll, we'll do the podcast and then live stream a Monopoly game, grab some lunch, and really show people, like, what we're talking about in terms of, okay. like, value and pricing right we'll do that hey guys thank you for your time as always i'm brandon from vegas this is mr bill gore lord come be my neighbor <laughs> Goy lord Goy, 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 Goy. <laughs> peace guys <laughs>